but welcome home and welcome to Easter in October. We're going to jump in right now and just tell you, have you ever read a book that was later turned into a movie? Raise your hand. Ever read a book that was later turned into a movie? All right. Have you ever watched a movie before you read the book? All right. So I don't know about you, but I think, how about this? We'll go this. How many of you have enjoyed the book more than the movie? How many enjoyed the movie more than the book? So the book wins out more than I, I actually, I think I prefer watching the movie before reading the book. That's just, you know, that's not everyone's preference. Like someone in the front row, we won't mention her name, my bride, but we won't mention her name, but uh, we're not going to mention, we won't do that. But that was actually true, the idea of preferring the, uh, the movie before reading the book. For me, it was true this summer. Sammy and I went on a few road trips. Some of them were to see her summer ministry teams that travel around from Ibu around the country, and then also we, we uh, traveled back from her parents' home with stuff in Las Vegas. So we've had some long road trips this summer. We listened to a few audio books. One of the books we listened to was Ready Player One. Now, um, it's a movie also. Steven Spielberg, Steven Spielberg directed the adaptation of that book into a movie, and I had already seen the movie. Shammy had not. And so we enjoyed the audiobook, really liked comparing what was, I liked comparing to what I had watched to what I'm listening to and noticing what is different. So even as it was happening, I'm like, the movie's running through my head, so I already got the, I got character faces and everything as this is going on, and I'm noticing these changes. After we finished listening to the audiobook, uh, we watched the movie. Uh, Shammy did not like most of the changes the movie makers made to this book, am I right? Yeah, so just, yeah. So um, they made changes, for, obviously, for movie storytelling purposes. And I think if I had read the book first, I would have agreed with Shammy. But I already watched the movie, so I had in my head, I'm like, oh, that's okay, he didn't do that. Oh, he added that, and, and this and that. So, you know, it, it just was different. I think one of the hardest things, though, for a movie producer, director, or screenwriter, is to adapt a book that is hundreds of pages and dozens of chapters into about a two-hour movie. And I, I don't know about you, but I think fans of any book series can be very unforgiving of movies made adapting their favorite books. We won't name any series, but I want you to imagine then being one of the four gospel writers. Now, they didn't make a movie, but they took the life of Jesus and they had to wrap the, the, the Jesus, his life and his journey and his story and his miracles and his teachings all into uh, each one's a little different, 20-something chapters for all of them except for Mark did it in 16 how Mark did that, you know, this is kind of, come on, right? Because the idea here is, is taking so much material, this vast amount of material, and putting it, condensing it into this smaller piece of work. Um, I love what John says in John 21, verse 25. He goes this, Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. Wow. I mean, how many of you guys are amazed about what you do know about Jesus on earth? Right? Just what we do know about Jesus on earth. Now, to, for John to say that everything that Jesus did couldn't be contained in the whole world. Wow. John, I'm going to go talk to John when I get up to heaven and say, John, tell me, tell me, come on. What did we miss? What did we not know? I want to know it. I got, I got to know it. I want to know it all. Or maybe I'll just go to Jesus. Jesus, what would you do? What would you do, Jesus? What would you do? Did, was there something that happened in Egypt that we didn't know about? You know, when you were a little kid, is there something we didn't know about when you were a teenager? What, what happened in the first 30 years? Why did you wait that long? Just all these different questions, right? The, the thing that, what did Jesus do that we don't know? So much. I mean, that was such an immense task. So then why did John write what he wrote? Becomes a big question. What was the purpose of his account of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection? Well, we've said actually all along in this journey that began in January for us, that John wrote his gospel for a few reasons. And so here's a few reasons. One, it was to fill in where other gospels did not go and share. So he wanted to fill in the other gospels. The other gospels were written before the John, John's gospel was written. And so he had already read those. He already knows what's in those. And so he fills in the gaps in many places in his gospel. The second thing is he shows us God's love. He shows us, but specifically, he shows us how much John felt God loved him. He, he, he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. And so he was loved by Jesus, and he wanted us to fill that love. And so the way that he writes it is to make sure that you could be able to understand, man, 
Jesus loves me too, just like he loves the disciple whom Jesus loved. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved, just like John. And the third thing was to bring people to this place of either belief or disbelief in Jesus. That John wanted to make sure you knew that Jesus didn't come just to unite, really he came to divide. He came to divide us into two, two groups of people, people who believe in him and people who don't believe in him. And so if you were not sure about that last one, belief or disbelief in Jesus, just need to read verse 31 of chapter 20 in the Gospel of John. He says this, but these are written, all of what he's read, all, all of what he's written, these are written so that you may continue to believe. Some scholars think it is, uh, may believe, not just continue to believe. So it was talking to those who already knew Jesus and those who didn't. So you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Amen. John wanted everyone to read his gospel to believe in Jesus. He wanted everyone who ever read his gospel, when it was done, they would believe in Jesus. Or if you read his gospel, that, that you would continue to believe in Jesus. This was his heart behind it. And so if you do believe in Jesus, you find this life in Jesus. And this idea of life, just so you guys know, just real quick, is a, there's, there's two Greek words for life, and one is zoe and the one is bios. And bios literally just means like life, like you can breathe. You just, you just, you're there, you have life. But zoe was a different kind of life. Zoe was a life that was eternal. It was a life that was spiritual. It was a life that was abundant. It's about hopes and dreams, all-encompassing life that was actually mentioned in John 10.10 when he quotes Jesus saying that I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. It was, I have, you have come, I've come so you have Zoe life. He wants you to have that kind of life and you have that kind of life when you believe in Jesus. So the events that John chose to include in his gospel were primarily picked to help you and me believe in Jesus as our Savior, Lord, and King. This belief in Jesus is so important to John and it's so important to Jesus that we're going to actually see that after his resurrection and he begins appearing to his disciples, he gave them all what they needed to believe. He gave them all what they needed to believe. And I want you to know that he does the same for you. We're going to see how what he does for them, he will also do for us. So let's jump into it. John 20, and we're just going to read the first seven verses and just check out the scene. It says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter the other, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Who's that? That's John. She said, they had taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they had put him. That's chaos right there. And so Peter and the other disciple, Peter and John, they start off to the tomb. They're both running. I love how John says, I outran Peter. Uh, but they both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Uh, maybe they had raced all three years, and, you know, finally John won. I don't know. Anyways, verse 5. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noted the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And who folds up? I mean, you resurrect, you take time to fold your clothes or whatever you know what a scene i mean think about this can you feel the energy and the chaos in the moment she gets there and she mary's like where jesus oh my goodness and there runs back to peter and peter and john like jesus is gone his body's gone where's Jesus' body peter and john take off john beats peter there he's looking whoa what's going on peter looks on he sees everything and they're just like wow what's going on in the chaos in this this confusion in this wonder there's doubt there's anxiety but there's also belief Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says this. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, who's that? John, also went in, and he saw and believed. I'm impressed with John. John has this immediate belief that Jesus has risen from the dead. He sees the empty grave. He sees the, the folded up linens and all that, and he goes, Jesus is alive. Now, it might be possible that Jesus, or John's believing this so quick and so instant because he was the one disciple who was at the cross and, and experienced all of that with Mary and the others. And so maybe this is why he has instant belief. But I can tell you right now, sometimes when you hear about Jesus, there are people who, boom, instantly believe. It doesn't take a lot of work for them to walk down the journey and say, yep, Jesus is Lord and Savior and King of my life. And I am so grateful for instant belief. 
like John's. But not everybody has instant belief. And Peter was one of them. Peter didn't have instant belief. In fact, if you were to read Luke's account in Luke 24, 12, it would say that Peter left confused or wondering about what had happened. I wonder if John, as they walked home, I don't think they ran, but walked home, maybe John tried to explain it all to Peter, and if he did, we do find out later that it didn't get Peter to a place of belief, at least not yet. Meanwhile, Mary had made her way actually back to the tomb. I don't know if she ran behind them or walked, said these guys are idiots for running, but um, so, so I don't know, but I mean, she just took her time, well, who knows? but she lingered there at the empty tomb after Peter and John left, and we see her encounter, starting in verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw the two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. So Mary hadn't believed yet. I mean, we know this right now because she's just saying they... Um, the body's gone. Where is where's the body of Jesus? She does, she's not thinking he's resurrected. She's thinking someone stole his body. She was so convinced of it. And I don't know why she doesn't recognize Jesus. I mean, some ideas are that she's been crying so much that her eyes have swollen up and she's just, her eyes are filled with tears and her vision's a little impaired at that moment because of all the tears and because, I mean, it's your savior, it's your teacher, it's, I mean, he's, his body's gone, the emotion of he's already died, you've been crying because of his death, and now you're crying more because of his body being taken, there, there's some of the ideas there, it's, some have said that it's because Jesus was in a divine supernatural state, so he didn't quite look like the Jesus that she knew, because he's a resurrected Jesus, not a uh, before death and resurrection Jesus, so maybe that's why she doesn't recognize it, but once she heard him say her name, everything changed for Mary. Verse 15, dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him. I will go and get him. Mary. Again, exclamation point, so not, we always say, Mary. Like he said it like all soft. and No, he's, he, Mary. I mean, there's like some command in her saying her name. And she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. With hearing just word, one word, hearing her name, she believed in Jesus. There's an interesting note about that verse, verse 16 and verse 17 that follows, because she, it, it, Jesus says that don't cling to me. Um, some think that maybe he actually, she actually was like holding on to Jesus and was then saying, you know, you can't, you can't cling to me like that. But some also think that maybe what she was clinging to was the Jesus before he died and resurrected because she didn't call him Lord, didn't call him Savior, didn't call him Son of God, didn't call him Messiah. She called him Rabboni. She called him teacher. That's what he was before he died. He was her teacher, her rabbi. After he died and resurrected, he's her Savior, her Messiah, the Son of God, her Lord. And so maybe he's actually doing that. He's saying, don't cling to that version of me. Cling to this version of me. There's all different thoughts on that, but what do you cling to? There's a great verse that I, I said to someone earlier today. It's 1 Timothy 1.19, and it starts by saying, cling to your faith in Christ. Keep your conscience clear. For some have deliberately violated their conscience, and as a result, their faith is shipwrecked. What are you clinging to? Don't cling to who Jesus was. Cling to who Jesus is. Cling to Jesus, most of all. And maybe that's what Jesus was helping her with. Mark 16, 11 does tell her, I'm sorry, does tell us that, that Mary went to the disciples and told the disciples that she had seen Jesus. And 16, 11 of Mark's gospel says the disciples didn't believe her. And so that means Peter doesn't believe yet in this moment either. Um, you could reference what about John, but we know John believed because I already showed it in John's gospel. So that night, guess what? Jesus shows up in person. Verse 19 and 20, Jesus showing up in person. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. 
not their teacher, but their Lord. Now, it's interesting. Peace be with you. It's the, on the, uh, in the other verse, but peace be with you. It's an interesting choice of first words to speak to his disciples when he sees this, his disciples. He didn't say, hey, what's up, guys? Hey, I'm here. He, he says, peace be with you. In some way of saying, hey, what's up, guys? I'm here. But peace be with you, the idea here, I think, is that this is his first chance to see uh, most of his disciples. He saw John when he was on the cross, and he gave his mother over to John. We know that, right? We looked at that. But most of the disciples he has not seen since the garden, and they deserted him. And one of them, Peter, has denied him three times, and Jesus knew he denied him three times, which John also uh, touches on in John 21. But what I, what I love here, the idea, I think, of the peace be with you is that this, when we are forgiven, we find peace. I think when, God, when Jesus is saying, peace be with you, he's also saying, I forgive you. I, I, I can't prove it, but I, I think there's just something there, the idea of this, these are the words he chose, peace be with you. I mean, he does it again when he sees them later on, so it may not be this, but I, I tell you it's true that not only when we give, or not only when we receive forgiveness, but when we give forgiveness, guess what we find? Peace. Don't hold unforgiveness to someone. Forgive them. You'll find peace. And if you need to forgive someone, forgive them, or you'll find peace. Or if you're forgiven for something, even if you don't know you did it, why you did it, just say thank you and receive the peace that comes from it. It's also clear that they believe now because they, it says they saw the Lord. The same thing Mary said to them earlier that day. Earlier, she said, I, I've seen the Lord. So we know she went from Rabboni to Lord. So she went to a place of belief. It's also when, uh, it's what they say when they tell Thomas. We'll see it in just a second. The only disciple who was not with them when they saw Jesus was Thomas, other than Judas, but Judas is dead. We understand that, right? So, but their words did not get to Thomas. When they say, hey, Thomas, we saw the Lord, it doesn't work. Thomas needs more than just to hear that Jesus is alive. He needs to see him, not just see him, he needs to touch him. John 20, 25. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless... I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. How does he know about that stuff? Well, John was right there. John saw it, so I wouldn't be surprised if John told all the disciples, this is what I saw. But let me ask you, because it says, I won't believe it unless. What's your unless? What's your unless? What is it going to take for you to believe? Not just believe in Jesus, but what's going to take for you to believe that Jesus provides everything that you need? What's going to take you for you to believe that, that Jesus, uh, the God in general, Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit, um, always keep their promises? What's it going to take? What's, what's your unless? What's it going to take for you to believe that he's always with you, even when chaos is happening around you? What's it going to take? What's your unless? So then... Um, after Passover, they made their way to Galilee about eight days later, because Passover is a seven-day celebration, and where Jesus said he would see them next. And we get to that next, and here Thomas is with them. Let's read verse 26 and 28. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. See, I told you. Uh, the doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you. Maybe he was saying that to Thomas directly, because the next thing he does say is directly to Thomas. Put your finger here. Where? into my wounds, into my scars. Oh, man, the, the idea. I mean, he's putting his, whoa. We all will get that chance in heaven. Hmm. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. Once Thomas touched Jesus, he believed. Now, Jesus takes a moment, and it's as if he is speaking to all of us that will come after Jesus ascends to heaven, and says this in verse 29. You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Have any of you seen Jesus alive? No. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. He was talking about you. He was talking about me. Isn't that so cool? Jesus was referencing us. Now, here's what we see and learn from these events on Easter Sunday. This Easter in October, I want you to get this. That Jesus gives to you what you need to believe in him. 
This is what we need to understand. I don't know where your faith is in Jesus if you don't have faith in Jesus, but if you were to look back on your journey to faith in Jesus, it doesn't look like mine. There might be some mirroring to it, but I guarantee it's not identical. In fact, my even journey with greater faith in Jesus does not look like yours. Our faith in Jesus, our belief in Jesus is different for all of us. Let me show you what I'm talking about, how Jesus gives to you what you need to believe in him, because he gave to the disciples. There's four four ways that Jesus gave what was needed to his disciples. Here's the first. John needed to see Jesus' empty tomb. That's it. John, John just needed to see the empty tomb. He didn't need to see Jesus. He didn't need to touch Jesus, didn't need to hear Jesus. He just needed to see that Jesus wasn't there no more. That's what John needed. What Mary needed was to hear Jesus' voice. She needed to hear his voice. The empty tomb wasn't enough, right? She was freaked out about the empty tomb. But when she heard her name come from her master, Jesus, she knew he was alive. Mary needed to hear Jesus' voice. Peter and the other disciples, other than Thomas, just needed to see Jesus in person. Peter saw the empty tomb, wasn't enough, he was confused by it, he was wondering what really happened, he's not sure, but when Jesus showed up, and he was there in person, Peter and the other disciples believed, except Thomas, and that's the last one, Thomas needed to touch Jesus to believe, he needed to touch Jesus' scars specifically, he needed to recognize his wounds specifically, say, this is my Lord, and my God. Jesus gave to the disciples what they needed to believe. Jesus gave to the disciples what he needed. What I love is he did not get mad at what each person's need was to believe. He did not think one person's belief was greater than another. He didn't think, oh, John, you're so much better than the rest. He didn't think, Thomas, you're so, it took you so much Oh, man, he just said, don't be faithless any longer, believe. He didn't get mad at him. He just said, dude, now's the time. Now it's the time to stop stop not believing and believe. For some of you, stop unbelieving and believe. And maybe it's not that you don't believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, but do you believe he's your provider? Are you thinking other things are your resources? Are you thinking that your job is what provides what you need? Or is it actually that Jehovah Jireh, the one whose name is the Lord who provides, is the one who provides what you need? Don't be faithless any longer and believe. He may not do it the way that you expected, the way that you desire, but he's still going to do it. He's still going to do it, you guys. And Jesus gave to them what they needed to believe in him. And I believe this for you, that Jesus gives to you what you need to believe in him. What do you need? Whatever, for those of you who have already put your faith in Jesus, whatever you needed to believe in him, he gave it to you. He made himself known. Some people have had visitations where they believe that's either the angel or that was Jesus who showed up. So maybe Jesus did show up for some people in some ways. I've known, I know people talked about this before. Like, I, I've heard God's voice. Like, I was having like, hey, Dave. I mean, it's like something deep inside. I'm like, God has said something. I am, a, I am a pastor because 30 years ago, God said to me, you're going to work with kids for the rest of your life. And then I am a lead pastor of church because about 17 years ago, he said, I want you to take care of my kids. You're going to serve my kids for the rest of your life. So I've heard his voice, and when I heard his voice, I believed. And in, in this, this season of this particular year for me, I've never really put, put words to, to my, my year. Some people theme, like here's my theme word or my theme verse. I didn't mean to have a theme, but I got a theme. He's the God of the unexpected. I've had a lot of unexpected happen this year, some of it good and some of it bad, some of it in the middle. But I've seen God in the midst of all of it, and I believe. He's given me what I need to believe that he cares about me. He's given me what I need to believe that I can trust in him. He's given me what I need to believe that he is guiding me. He's doing the same for you. Whatever you need to believe, I believe he'll give it to you because he loves you that much. So just a few questions here to finish. Are you here, here and do you believe in Jesus? 
do you believe in Jesus? And if you do, I've got a simple question for you. What did you need to believe in Jesus? What did you need to believe in Jesus? I bet what you need is not what everyone here or online needed or needs. But think about it. What did you need to believe? He provided what you needed to believe in him. And it's not going to stop just with your faith in him. In about 50 days, actually this is about 42 days from this last moment we just read, he gives the disciples and the, other, and the others in the upper room the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because it's what they needed. He still does it. And if you don't believe in Jesus, I've got a question for you. What do you need to believe in Jesus? What do you need? <laughs> Have you asked him? Well, as Schwartz said to Flick in the Christmas story, I triple dog dare you to ask him. I triple dog dare you to ask Jesus to give you what you need to believe in him. I triple dog dare you to ask Jesus what you need to believe in him. And for some of you, it will be belief again. For some of you, it will be belief anew. For some of you, it's belief in something you weren't believing in about him. And now you're going to step up and say, well, I already got triple dog dare. It's like, you can only pass that. So I got triple dog dare. I better step up and I better ask Jesus what I need to believe in him. I believe that Jesus gives to everyone what they need to believe in him. I don't think it just stops with his disciples. I don't think it just stops with faith and trust in him. I believe he gives us what we What are you waiting for? Like Jesus said, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. John wanted everyone to read his gospel and to believe. John wanted everyone in his gospel to continue to believe in Jesus. And those who did believe would find life eternal, life abundant through Jesus. <laughs> I've got two statements for prayer today it's really just this simple uh you're here and you need jesus and you're here and you really need jesus take that for what you want usually the first one i need jesus means i don't have jesus as my lord and savior and i want to say yes to jesus but what do you need to believe like really believe like walk out of here with this belief that no matter what comes your way, no matter what trouble, you take on 1 Timothy 1.19 and you cling to your faith in Christ and you don't violate your conscience. You keep your conscience clear because you don't want your faith shipwrecked in Jesus. You want to keep believing. When you leave here today, no matter if you know Jesus for 40-something years like myself or longer than that or you've known him for four weeks or whatever you've known him, whether you're online or in person, when this is done, I want you to walk out of here with I believe in Jesus. And I know he's going to give me what I need, not want, but what I need to continue to believe in Jesus. And can I just tell you, that's why John wrote his gospel. He wrote everything in his gospel that you might believe and continue to believe in Jesus. So he's already given you what you need. You have to simply do what the disciples did. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And be like Thomas and say, my Lord, my God, I believe. As you close your eyes, dear Jesus, I pray for anyone in this room that simply needs to believe in you. That they would put their full trust in you. If you're here in person and you need to believe in Jesus, really believe in Jesus, I ask you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand so that's me. I need to believe. Thank you. I need to believe in Jesus. Online, say, I need Jesus. And Laura will pray with me. God, I just pray 
God, I know so many of us in this room have already got our faith in you, but may we really, truly believe in you. And leave here with that belief and that trust. And we pray, amen. You can all stand as I finish with a challenge and question. The challenge here is ask God each day this week, how am I supposed to help others get what they need to believe in Jesus? God doesn't want you just to believe in him and leave it at that. He wants you to help others come to believe in him. Ask God to show you during this week, each morning, each night, how am I supposed to help others get what they need to believe in Jesus? And here's your conversation questions that we encourage you to take on with you. And and very simply is what did it take for you to believe in Jesus? How are you supposed to help others believe in Jesus? Who do you know that needs to believe in Jesus? Have conversations with others, and maybe you'll find out some people who need to believe in Jesus, and you'll be the one to help them through it. We're going to take a moment. We're going to sing that song again, Come Now. Um, I I will be out over by um, the seating area for the cafe with donuts for you guys to come hang out. Just grab one, talk to me. Uh, If you don't want, just come and give me a high five or a fist fist bump or whatever. Um, Also, because it's Easter, Easter's always got a photo op, right? Easter's always got a photo opportunity, so over by where the donuts are, that, that wall, that, uh, that wood wall, there's a sign there. It says Easter uh, in October at New Life. Take that. Go ahead and just take a picture, and Bailey's holding it up right there. It's that, it's that right there. Just take a picture. Just come on. It's Easter. It's Easter in October. Take the picture. So, uh, you, know, so you, you, you may have not dressed up for Easter like I did today. It's okay. But just take a picture and say, hey, it's Easter in October. Your kids got some special candy. So did those who are new. And if you're new here and you didn't get something, go back there to guest services and get something. And then, uh, yeah, let's have a great Easter in October because of belief in him. Go ahead, guys. Why don't you lead us in a song? And I'll see you guys.